Father, open our hearts to your word and your word to our hearts. In Jesus' name, Amen. Amen. Treacherous colleagues, competitive friends, ruthless commuters. It is a war out there, and according to Robert Greene, it's a conflict we are ill-equipped to deal with. After analysing the moves of history's great military leaders, he's written a rule book to achieving victory in life's daily battles. Spanning world civilizations, synthesizing dozens of political, philosophical, religious texts, and thousands of years of conflict, the 33 Strategies of War is a comprehensive guide to the subtle social game of everyday life informed with the most ingenious and effective military principles of war. Abundantly illustrated with uh, examples uh, from history, uh, Napoleon Bonaparte to Margaret Thatcher, from Shaka the Zulu to Lord Nelson, from Hannibal to Ulysses S. Grant, each of the 33 chapters outlines a strategy that will help you win in life's wars. <clears throat> You, if you're reading on the back cover, it says you can learn the offensive strategies that require you to maintain the initiative, negotiate from a position of strength, or the defensive strategies designed to help you respond to dangerous situations and avoid unwinnable wars. Well, according to the publisher, Penguin, this is an indispensable book. Well, they would say that, wouldn't they? Because the great warriors of the battlefields and drawing rooms alike demonstrated prudence, agility, balance, calm, and a keen understanding that the rational, resourceful, and intuitive always defeat the panicked, the uncreative, and the stupid. Well, that's the 33 strategies of war. It provides you with all the ammunition you need um, to overcome patterns of failure and forever gain the upper hand, whether it's at home, in business, or in social life. Well, uh, this morning, we're going to compare two other strategies, one that you won't find in uh, the 33 strategies of war, and that's the strategy of Jesus. And we're going to compare Jesus' strategy with the Pharisee's strategy, which does indeed show a remarkable similarity to um, our friend, um, uh, what's his name? <laughs> I've forgotten his name. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. It doesn't matter. Here we go. The context was in that verse 16 of chapter 2, Mark chapter 2. Uh, Jesus was going through the grain fields and as his disciples walked along, they began to pick some heads of grain. And they began to rub them in their hands and they ate them, just as you might eat a bag of nuts. But the Pharisees said to Jesus, why are they doing what is unlawful on the Sabbath? Well, what was the strategy of the Pharisees? The first was to intimidate, intimidate. They stalked the disciples. They were close enough to the disciples to see what they were doing. They were helping themselves to some ears of corn. Luke 6, as the Pharisees and the teachers of the law were looking for a reason to accuse Jesus, and they watched him closely. They watched him closely. Do you know when you are being watched closely? I'm monitored continuously on the internet because I get into a lot of hot water in the Middle East particularly. But the Pharisees are using Greener's strategy number 11, which is know your enemy. Know your enemy. Get close enough to know their weaknesses. And that's why they stalked the disciples. They were so close they intimidated. But the second thing they did was they tried to isolate them. They criticized their behavior. They asked, why are they doing what is unlawful? Notice they didn't go to the, to the, uh, the disciples and say, why are you? They went to Jesus. Why are they? You see, they were trying to isolate Jesus, isolate the disciples. They were seeking to intimidate.
and doing the right things. These guys were hungry, but it was the Sabbath, and rubbing the ears of corn was work, and you're not allowed to work on the Sabbath. So notice their strategy. They stalked the disciples, they criticized their behavior, they condemned his values, and then they conspired to destroy him. Intimidate, isolate, incriminate, and I haven't got an eye, it's liquidate. They tried to liquidate Jesus. Some of them were looking for a reason to accuse Jesus. And then after he performed this fantastic miracle, what happens, verse 6, the Pharisees went out and began to plot with Herodians how they might kill Jesus. I've got to level 3. Luke adds, they were furious. Jesus had flouted their laws, he'd overruled their authority, he'd exposed their hatred before the entire crowd in the synagogue. They were blinded by hate. So when Jesus exposed their motives, he became their enemy. Jesus anticipated this. In Matthew chapter 10, he said, I'm sending you out as sheep among wolves, therefore be as shrewd as snakes and innocent as doves. Now notice Jesus didn't say, become sheep in wolves' clothing, or worse, become wolves in sheep's clothing, and there are plenty of those around. That's why you probably won't find the strategy of Jesus in Robert Greene's 33 Strategies of War. So how did Jesus deal with opposition? How does Jesus want us to deal with opposition? Well, there are three things we can observe from uh, Mark chapter 2 and Mark chapter 3. When they condemned Jesus, Jesus counted their hypocrisy with scripture. He took them back to the Bible. Jesus answered, have you never read what David did when he and his companions were hungry and in need? In the days of Abathar the high priest, he entered the house of God and ate the consecrated bread, which is lawful only for priests to eat, and he gave some to his companions. Then he said to them, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. The Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. You see, the Pharisees were professional theologians. They were like clergy and judges all rolled into one. Thankfully, we don't have them today in the UK. But Jesus questioned whether they had even read the Scriptures. He's, a, he's suggesting your question is rather elementary one that reveals your very poor grasp of Scripture. It was a very subtle rebuke. And the story is uh, in 1 Samuel 21. Don't turn to it now. But each week there were 12 loaves of bread baked, representing the 12 tribes of Israel, and they were placed on the, uh, on the uh, table in the house of God, the tabernacle. And at the end of the week, the old bread was replaced and eaten by the priests, and new bread was put on the table. But on this occasion, the high priest gave some of the bread to David and his men to eat it because they were hungry and they were fleeing from Saul. David's need for food was more important than the priestly regulation. Now, by comparing himself with David, Jesus is doing something very significant. He's saying, if you condemn me, then you must also condemn David. Do you see what he's doing? And by referring to himself as the Lord of the Sabbath, Jesus is claiming authority over them and redefining the Sabbath as it is, a day of refreshment, of worship, and wholeness and healing. So Jesus countered their hypocrisy with Scripture. And I suggest that is how we should counter criticism. We should look into the Scriptures to see if there is truth in what people say, and repent, and if it's not, counter what they say from Scripture. Because the Bible is God's Word, it is the uh, sword of the Spirit, and it cuts through every human argument, every false premise, every deceitful scheme. Our responsibility, says Paul to Timothy, is to handle the Bible accurately. 
And to handle the Bible accurately, you have to have a firm grasp on it. You have to have a firm grasp. Hearing, reading, studying, meditating, memorising, having a firm grasp in God's Word. So that, like Jesus, we can counter hypocrisy from Scripture. But the second thing Jesus did was he challenged their motives with substance, with reality rather than theory. Jesus said to the man with a shriveled hand, stand up in front of everyone. Then Jesus asked them, which is lawful on the Sabbath, to do good or to do evil, to save life or to kill? But they remained silent. And why did they remain silent? Because they couldn't answer him. He challenged their motives. He turned the tables upon them. You know, there is a difference between tradition and traditionalism. Tradition is the living faith of those now dead. We are surrounded by images and, uh, uh, of, of those who have died in the faith of Christ and they remind us to persevere. But the difference between tradition and traditionalism is that we are blessed by the living faith of those now dead. Our hymns are good examples of that. Traditionalism, however, is the dead faith of those now living. The dead faith of those now living. By that I mean they do things and they don't know why they do them. They do them because we've always done them. You know, when I come to a church for the first time, I want to find out how things are done, so I try and do them right. I did them wrong uh, at least once this morning. Maybe you can, you can tell me others. I didn't have a hymn between the first and the second reading, and I apologize for that. Um, but it was unintentional, okay? There's a difference between unintentionality and intentionality. So there's a difference between tradition and traditionalism. Jesus' critics were locked in traditionalism. They'd long forgotten the reason for the Sabbath. All that mattered was that they kept the rules. They focused on mindless rules, legalism. So never let your traditions become traditionalism. People become like the Pharisees when they use religion to judge and condemn others rather than reaching out to help and to love. So how does Jesus respond? He takes the initiative. He stands up to his opponents. But he doesn't fight them on their hypocritical terms. He doesn't use their methods. He appeals to their logic as well as their conscience. He did it uh, earlier in Mark chapter 2 when uh, the paralytic man was dropped down in front of him on a Sabbath. And they were there in the front row, the Pharisees, waiting to convict him. And so in that occasion, he said, which is easier, to say your sins are forgiven or get up and walk? It's a darn sight easier to say your sins are forgiven than it is to say get up and walk. But he says, so that you know I have power to forgive sins, get up and walk. And the guy gets up and walks. And he does the same here. He doesn't do anything. What does Jesus do? He speaks. He just speaks. Stretch out your hand. That's all he said. They were unwilling to repent, unwilling to concede his logic, unwilling to recognize his power, unwilling to submit to his authority. And that's why he counted their hypocrisy with scripture, he challenged their motives with substance, and then he channel, channeled his passion, his anger. There's nothing wrong with anger as long as we channel it constructively. He channeled his passion into saving. Into saving, Mark 5. He looked around at them in anger and deep distress at their stubborn hearts. And said to the man, stretch out your hand. And the man stretched out his hand. And his hand was completely restored. I think this is the only time in the Bible Jesus performs a miracle while angry. The stilling of the storm, he was, he was angry with the, with the storm when he said, be still. And they had to be still. But here he was angry with people. 
He was angry and in deep distress. But how does he channel that anger? Not with barbs, not with words that will attack, but words that will heal. Isn't it amazing that we go back to Genesis chapter 1 and 2, and the creation narrative is about how God created, and how God created with words. He spoke, let it be, and it was. Let there be light. Jesus does the same here. He creates a new hand with his spoken word. So how should we handle opposition? In Romans chapter 12, God insists, do not repay anyone evil for evil. Do not take revenge. Do not become overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. It's possible. Again, in Ephesians 4, Paul says, In your anger do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry. Deal with it before sundown. See, Jesus had come to seek and save the lost. And he would not allow those who opposed him, who stood in his way, to sidetrack him from his purposes or deflect him from his mission. He didn't back down and he wasn't intimidated. There's a brilliant book by John Maxwell called There's No Such Thing as Business Ethics and in there is a list of his do's and don'ts and one of them is I do not intimidate and I will not be intimidated. It's a very powerful sentence, say it. I do not intimidate and I will not be intimidated. So much of what happens in the church, so much of what happens in politics and in diplomacy is all about what will people think. And we have self-censorship and people don't say what they should say, they don't do what they should do because they are afraid. They are intimidated by the Pharisees today. See, Jesus promised, no servant is greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you. And Paul adds, in fact, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. 2 Timothy 3. So today, you have a choice. You can follow Robert Greene's The 33 Strategies of War, or you can follow Jesus' strategy for peace. Because like Jesus, we have a mission to fulfill, regardless of our circumstances, irrespective of the opposition, we are called to follow Jesus, to know him and to make him known. And whatever keeps us from our God-given purpose is our enemy. It is our enemy. We will plan for God's pleasure to spend time with him every day, reading his word, in prayer. We were formed for God's family to meet with his people every Sunday, to build one another up. We were created to become like Jesus. We were shaped to serve him in and through his church. And we were made for a mission, like Jesus, to be peacemakers. So what was Jesus' strategy for peace? He countered hypocrisy with scripture, he challenged motives with substance, and he challenged, channeled his passion into saving. How should we model our lives on him? Don't let other their traditions on you. Deal with the causes of conflict, not the symptoms, and seek peace. Don't let anyone deter you anything detract you from fulfilling God's purpose. So in the week ahead, when you face opposition, as you probably will, realize that loving others will make you enemies, however uh, we may try to avoid it. And then remember the most important thing I'm going to say this morning. It's not a question of which strategy we follow, but whose strategy. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, we praise and thank you for the Lord Jesus. And in our gospel reading today, 
how he's shown us how to deal with conflict, with opposition, with evil. Lord, in the week ahead, may we be reminded of these words and Jesus' strategy, and by your grace and by the power of your Holy Spirit, may we be enabled to follow his example and be mediators of reconciliation in a hostile world. We pray this for your glory, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I invite you to stand as we affirm our faith in the words of the Creed. <coughs>